Hello and welcome to this first lecture on convex optimization. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about a lot of cool stuff on convex optimization, which is such a cool topic. I would say it's found everywhere in our world that we live in. <laughs> Everything that you do in your life is based on convex optimization. When you wake up till the moment you go to sleep, while you're sleeping, anywhere, anytime, in any place, and whatever you're doing. So the first thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is what does optimization mean? What does that word mean? And how do we form a problem mathematically in optimization? Here's the part which we're going to, you know, write down, me and you, and I'm going to explain what that means, right? Next off, we're going to give some examples on optimization. So after showing some examples, it happens in optimization that sometimes you cannot arrive at the best solution due to some factors. And those factors we're going to talk about is, you know, time complexity and a lot of other compromises that come into play when you're solving your problem or when you want to reach your problem. Because it also happens in optimization that there's no closed form or analytical solution to your problem. So you can't just, you know, give me an equation and tell me, oh, this is the equation that solves your problem. You just plug in, you know, alpha and beta and some other variables and you give me the solution. It's not only that. Sometimes your solution needs to be formed in a fixed point iterative way or in a recursive, I don't know, function. It really depends on the type or where your solution belongs. So yeah, we're going to be talking about those factors. Next, we're going to talk about problems that are both efficient and reliable. And what I mean by those are those that are of type least squares, linear programming, and most importantly, convex optimization, which is what this course is about, right? Everything before this point is optimization in general. And here we're going to come to focus on convex optimization. Right. So in this section of the lecture, we're going to show examples of problems that are both reliable and efficient. OK, so in other words, the theory that the community of, you know, mathematics and mathematical optimization that have come to and the, of course, the tools that they suggest are enough to solve those problems that you see in front of you, because we're going to see that least squares and linear programming are just an instance of convex optimization. They fall into the category of convex optimization. So yeah, the tools that the community have suggested are enough to solve those problems that you see in front of you in a very reliable way. So after talking about those efficient and reliable problems, we're going to set the goals of this course. So to which audience this course is targeted. So the first and most important goal of this course is given a certain optimization problem, you should come to recognize that this problem is a convex one. Sometimes it happens that you're given a very hard looking problem, you know, it turns out that some, you know, sort of tricks, you flip the problem around how we flip pancakes. It's the same way, you know, you hide this variable, you absorb this one, you do some sort of tricks, Houdini. <laughs> and then it turns out that this problem is convex. In contrast to what I just said, sometimes you're given a very easy looking problem. You know, it's so easy. You look at it and wow, it's super ridiculously easy, right? But it's very hard to solve it. And more than that, it's not convex. Next thought in this course, one goal is to learn how to program and to write code. I will not say programming because the tools that we're going to be using, the the environment is mostly MATLAB or Python or even R. I, I still didn't set my mind on that. But based on the emails that I'm going to be receiving from you guys, I'll see which, you know, environment is mostly voted for. And, you know, I'll try to be flexible because I don't take hard decisions. <laughs> if, let's say, we arrive at 70% MATLAB, 20% Python or the other way around, I'll try to do both in Python and MATLAB. Really. And last but not least, the goal of this course is not only to give an optimal solution, but, you know, to give a meaningful description of what this solution is. And sometimes when you cannot arrive at the optimal solution, let's call it a good solution. And we're going to set some bounds on how good the solution is. Right. So they're called performance bounds. OK, last but not least, 
goal six is to give some history on optimization. So when it all started, down to different methods and all these kind of cool stuff. And finally, before wrapping up this course, we're going to give the references used for the making of this course. So as you can see, the references are right here. And then that's it. That's what this lecture is about. Without further ado, let's talk about what optimization is. Okay, what is optimization? So you have a problem with some constraints and you would like to find the best solution or the optimal solution that solves the problem and at the same time satisfies the constraints. So mathematically, how we can define an optimization problem is as follows. So you would like to, let's say, minimize a certain cost function. The standard way of writing an optimization problem is you would want to minimize the function. In some references, of course, you find maximizing a certain objective function, but most likely it's a minimization problem. So subject to some constraints. So you have, let's say, first constraint is a function less than a certain constant, b1. f2 of x is less than b2 down to fm of x less than b m now here we see that x is one variable but this is not necessarily the case indeed x could have multiple values so it could be a vector of variables namely we can have here x a vector of x1 x2 down to xn so if you want to write this function in a different way you could just say you know f0 of x1 down to xn so it's a function of n variables right but we do not usually write this we write x and it is understood that x is a vector of n variables and another way to write you know a bunch of constraints is just using a simple line fi of x because i is varying from 1 to m so we have m functions less than b i where i goes from 1 till m so really another way to write the optimization problem we had is simply by saying we could just minimize f0 of x subject to f i of x less than b i where i is between 1 and m and x belongs to r n so now let's talk about some terminology you know we usually call f 0 x the cost function so this guy right here is called the cost function or the objective function so this is your objective you would like to minimize this function right here but you cannot minimize it in all r n so you have some constraints to take into consideration which are f i of x less than b i you have m constraints so those here, we call them constraint functions, right? So those are your constraints. If you're not free to work in Rn, you should take those constraints into consideration. So instead of wandering around in Rn, you should be in the space defined by your constraints. As an example, as a really small example, let's say you have a one-dimensional problem, right? So n is equal to one, right? So you only have one variable x. And you would want to minimize f0 of x, where f0 of x is, you know, it looks like this. I'm not going to give it an explicit definition. I'm just going to draw it on the graph. So it looks like this, and then it bends down over here, and then it explodes up. So it looks something like this. Okay, so if the problem does not have any constraints, then what is the point x that minimizes this function of course it's the point right here corresponding to this minimum right here which is x star on the x-axis right so yeah if the problem had no constraints then this is your solution x star which is the point right here so i could say that x star is the solution to my un constrained problem so in other words we worked in r right now on the other hand if i told you that oh you have a constraint you're not allowed to work in the global field you should instead work given that your x 
is less than one. So as simple as that, this is one constraint. I gave you one constraint. So that being said, you have a function f1, which is defined as x, and your b1 would be one in that case. Now, if we want to match it to the previous definition, and then you have f1 less than b1. So geometrically, what that means is that you're bounded by that is one right here, then you should be working only in this area. So everything to the left of this blue line, right? So in other words, you should only be looking right here, in that sense, over here. So in the shaded blue region, what is the point that minimizes the function? It's somewhere right here, right? This is your optimal solution. So what does that actually mean? It means that your solution, of course, would differ depending on the constraints. Each constraint you add, you might and most probably will end up with a different optimal solution. So the third term right here is x star. x star is the solution to my problem. And it is called the optimal solution. It's the optimal solution. Okay, so x star is what solves my problem, my constraint problem. So a summary of what we just said, we have three terms to keep in mind. The objective or cost function, which is the function you're minimizing, which is that black curve right here. You've got constraint functions, so it's where you're working. If it's unconstrained, then you have no constraint functions. If it's constrained, like in the case right here, it's the function that defines the constraint, which is f of x, or f1 of x is x right and you know b1 is a certain level so it's also within the constraints but the constraint function is f i of x and later on in the course you would see that b i would be absorbed by f i of x because we'd always want to keep a zero on the right hand side and last but not least we have the optimal solution to the problem which is x star it is the solution to my problem it is the point where f zero of x is minimized and at the same time the constraints are satisfied. So let's talk about some examples. You know, mathematical optimization is found almost everywhere nowadays. So if I write here mathematical optimization at the top of the pyramid, we can find countless applications to mathematical optimization, varying from electrical engineering to economics, marketing. I'll start off with portfolio optimization. So in portfolio optimization, your aim is to maximize your return or your aim is to minimize your risk given some investments per asset. So what's going on in portfolio optimization is that you have a certain budget, right? And in the constraints of your problem, you define stuff like the minimum or maximum investment for each asset. You would also want to define a minimum return. I have this budget. What is the best strategy? What is the best amount to invest with given all my constraints that I just mentioned? Now, indeed, there's a lot of models. There's a lot of problems that have been proposed within the past. So the models that are the most known, let's start off with the Markowitz model. So I'm not going to go deep into the math of what the Markowitz model is, but basically what it is, is you allocate, you put some funds to stock, and you would want to minimize the risk for a target rate of return. So what that means is that you have some funds and you would like to, you know, just throw the funds into the market. You want to buy some stocks, but you're not sure which stocks to buy. So this is my target rate. And my goal is I don't want to take too much risk. I want this rate as minimum you have some funds and you would want to find the best strategy where to plant where to invest in those money your goal is to minimize your risk so okay what is the best way i could throw my money in the market in the way that my risk is minimized now other additional constraints that enter my problem are stuff like the variance and covariances of the variables in the model so this is one optimization problem in portfolio analysis or portfolio optimization. Now another type of or another model of portfolio optimization is the stock portfolio optimization problem. And in stock, you know, it uses a VBA macro to optimize multiple scenarios for minimizing risk at different target levels. Then you would like to graph, you know, 
a certain efficient frontier. Other types of portfolio optimization are the bond portfolio management. You've also got the bond portfolio exact matching. I'm not going to go deep into what all those are because really the goal of this course is to tackle the mathematical part of what mathematical optimization is. It's not going into details or applications such as finance or portfolio as we talked right here or electrical engineering. No, the goal is to know how to solve optimization problems in case you're faced with one or to find the trade-offs between an optimal solution and an efficient solution. This is what this course is. Indeed, when we give some examples, they are inspired from practical scenarios. Now, with that being said, I'll just go ahead and just give one more application because I don't want to waste too much time on applications or examples on optimization because I'm sure you're not here watching this video because of me talking about applications of this um, topic. So one area where mathematical optimization is so famous is electrical engineering and in particular in telecommunications where, you know, you have some base stations and there's a channel between users and base stations. And the problem is, okay, so this channel means I can allocate some data rate. To maintain some data rate to users, you need power. And power means in engineering, money, resources. So the more power you pump in a channel, the more money you're paying as a operator, right? So the problem here is what is the best strategy that I could satisfy all my users? In other words, I want to maintain a minimum bit rate to my users. So they are satisfied with the speed of the internet. But at the same time, I don't want to lose too much power. So I'm giving you a certain budget, a certain power. I don't want to spend more. I, don't, I would not say no if I will spend less, right? So this is the maximum power I'm going to spend. But at the same time, I want all my users to be satisfied. So it turns out that the solution to this problem is the so-called water filling. So water filling is a method that is used to find the best strategy to pump or send data in multiple channels in an optimal way in the sense that I do not lose a lot of power, right? So I have that much power. What is the best strategy that I satisfy my users and at the same time I do not lose a lot of power, okay? And this is really the word water filling is inspired by farmers. So farmers have also resources like seeds, water, and so on. They have those resources, they don't have more, but they would not say no if they would use less so that they could keep on the side for future use. So anyways, they have this resource, seeds, plants to plant, and they have this land, right? So their problem is given the season they're in and given the the situation the the type of you know the type of soil what is the best strategy they could plant the seeds in a way that would maximize their return other sub domains in electrical engineering where you could find mathematical optimization is electronics so in electronics you know you have those semiconductors those microchips and in electronics, you know, you work on a micro or nano scale most of the time. So you would not like to exceed certain dimensions. So your variables to take into account is stuff like the length and width of your device. And the constraints are stuff like I have this maximum area that I want to use. Let's say this is your maximum area. I don't want more than 10 by 10 centimeters of the total chip. This is the maximum area. This goes into the constraint of your problem. And your objective would be, again, power consumption. Okay, so what are some factors that come into play when you're considering a certain optimization problem? In some cases, it turns out that the solution to your problem, so let's say I have this problem right here, written in standard form, but it turns out to reach the solution X star, I need either a lot of time or I need to do a lot of complicated stuff right so really time complexity is how much time you need to 
to reach your solution. And in time, we mean computational time. How many multiplications I need? Because in the end, in some cases, you have a certain method. You don't have a closed form solution, a nice compact solution like x is equal to this function right here. You just plug in, you know, some y value which we got from somewhere and voila this is my solution no it's not an, a closed form solution no i'm talking in a case where you're obliged to do some fixed point iterations to reach your desired or your optimal solution and even more so your solutions are not in polynomial time i'm not going to go deep into that but what that basically means is that you do not have you know time to solve your problem and an accurate definition to np hard is a problem that is at least as hard as the hardest problems in np let's put it that way so this has a rigorous mathematical definition but in other words it means that the time complexity to solve this method is not in polynomial time i don't know where it is it has some sort of weird time complexity but it's not polynomial it's not something that you could write as o n of alpha let's, let's put it that way right so it's not there it's somewhere else so an example of np hard is integer factorization let's say prime factorization where you're decomposing a composite number into a product of smaller integers and each integer is by itself a prime number. This process is called prime factorization. So this process you're doing is NP hard because given, okay, maybe a problem could be solved, but not all problems, not all integers, not all given integers have the same time complexity as other integers, right? You cannot write it down. It's not clear. So going back to factors, that come into play when solving an optimization problem. Sometimes you're also faced with problems where your solution could not be achieved, not because of time complexity, because you cannot find the solution. So in that case, maybe the problem is not feasible. Maybe the problem does not have a solution. Maybe there's multiple solutions. Maybe the minimization problem cannot satisfy all the constraints. So there's some sort of trade-off between constraints of the problem and the objective function. So in this case, we talk about compromises between the solution and the constraints. Now, if a newcomer is coming into optimization theory and he's watching the factors right here, it'd say, or she'd say, oh, so, so there's a lot of problems right now that I cannot tackle by myself because it's either time complex NP hard, sometimes I cannot solve it due to some compromises. Well, no, that's not always the case. This is the worst case you might face. But on the bright side, you have well-known solutions such as least squares or LS. So it turns out that many of our problems, you know, their solutions boil down to the LS or the least squares problem. You also have other types of problems which fall under the category of linear programming. So we've got the LS, we've got the linear programming, we've also got convex optimization. So convex optimization is one branch of mathematical optimization. You've also got those problems which are mathematically called convex. So you could say that this problem is convex. You also have non-convex because they're not convex, you call them non-convex. You've got non-linear but nonlinear does not mean that it is not convex. No, on the contrary, many, many, many nonlinear problems that we face fall into the convex optimization category. You can just do some tricks, write it differently, and voila, they're convex optimization problems. We'll also see that later in the course. Okay, so we're going to talk now about the efficient or reliable problems that are easily solved. Now, Let's start off with least squares. What does it do? What is the mathematical optimization problem behind this type of solution? The problem is basically the following. We'd like to minimize AX minus B square. Now this is a Frobenius norm, okay? An L2 norm. And what that means is that, so if you're given a vector X square in Frobenius norm or L2 norm, it is nothing other than the sum of its entries, all squares. So it's the sum of squares 
of all the entries of this vector. So as an example, if I had the vector 3, 4, and its Frobenius norm should be 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 5 squared, or 25. Right, so why is this problem famous? Well, as you can see here, I have a matrix A and a vector B, and we're minimizing over the vector X. So as you can see, we're, we're checking to see how far is this vector right here, AX, from the vector B. And the solution would be the one that minimizes this distance between AX and B. And as you can see here, I didn't pose any constraints. So this is a problem with no constraints. This problem is widely used in optimization, and it's known as the least squares problem. You're minimizing the squares between two quantities, right? And you're trying to find the best x that fits this cost function. It turns out that the optimal solution, this problem, x star, is a transpose a inverse a transpose b. So it's written as a function of a and b, of course. Now in the simple 1D case where a is just, you know, a number, it's just a scalar, right? everything is a scalar, you could easily verify that this boils down to b over a. So what is the x that minimizes this cost function when they're all scalars? It's when x is equal to b over a. So you can see that the a cancels with the a, and then you're left with b minus b, which is zero, which is the minimum possible you could achieve with this cost function. You've also got some stuff like, is a transpose a invertible? Well, if not, then such a solution does not exist. So going back to what we said previously about the existence of a solution. So in our case here, in this type of problem, if the inverse of A transpose A does not exist, then the problem does not have a solution. You cannot write it down. It doesn't exist. Now, here's where you start talking about compromises. You would pose some constraints to the problem so that the problem has a solution. That being said, there is a lot of efficient methods or softwares, I would say, to solve this type of problem. All you need to do is just invert a matrix and then multiply it with a vector. That's it. You have the solution. So the time complexity here for this method is of the order. So if A belongs to the following space of matrices, let's say M by N, then the time complexity is of order M N squared just count how many multiplications and additions you did, you would end up with something proportional to mn squared. Now, if you're into research, if you're, if you're working on your PhD or you're in a postdoc, you're going to see this a lot in papers. So a lot of problems are formulated in a least square sense. How good is it in, uh, in your application? It depends. It depends on the model. It depends on the type of noise and so on. But what I mean to say is that it is found in redundancy. There's other modified versions of least squares, like which x, so you know the x vector has the entries x1 down to xn. So let's say you would want to minimize one more than the other. So you're waiting right here. You're waiting one x. You're giving more preference to one x over the other. So in that case, you talk about weighted least squares, right? So you have a weighting matrix. This weighting matrix would model interactions between variables, would also highlight which x is more, let's say, important than the other. So what you need to know is that there's modifications of least squares. So that's it for least squares. That's all I have to say as an introduction. Of course, within the course, we should see the derivation of least squares. Now let's hop onto the next subtopic, which is linear programming. So linear programming another type of problem where you're minimizing a simple cost function. So x has, you know, the quantities x1 down to xn. And in this case, you would minimize c1 x1 plus cn xn. Or in other words, if you would want to write it in vector form, this is of the form c transpose x. So I'll write this between parentheses in case you would want to write it in vector form. C subscript i means the ith component of the vector c, and c is a given quantity. You don't have to worry about it. It's given. So this is just a linear combination of your x entries, of the entries you're trying to minimize, and thus the name linear programming. And not just that, the constraints right here, subject to, 
also your constraints enjoy a linear form. You could also say ai transpose x is less than bi. So indeed, ai is a vector of the same dimensions of x, and bi is a scalar. It's just a number. And i goes from 1 to m. So this is, again, in standard form, your function f nod or f0 of x is c transpose x and your constraints fi of x are of the form ai transpose of x. So as you can see right here the problem is in linear form and thus the name linear programming. So solving such problems have unfortunately no closed form solutions like we saw in least squares right here. However there's a lot of methods to solve such problems like simplex, like there's a lot of methods like in the literature and each one has its own time complexity, efficiency, right? And, you know, the time complexity for methods to solve this problem are in general proportional to m square n. m is the number of constraints, right? And n is the number of variables in your problem. And this is the case when you have more constraints than variables okay now it's not that much recognized as much as least squares of course it's, it is a recognized problem linear programming is everywhere but least squares is more famous i would say okay there's a lot of hard problems in the literature like problems where the objective function is not even convex like problems in l1 norm it turns out that there's a lot of tricks people do in research that they convert an l1 problem which is not even convex or even L infinity problems. L infinity, which is an, the infinite norm, means the maximum of entries in a vector. What is the maximum entry? So if I tell you the infinite norm of the vector 1, 10, it is simply just the maximum, which is 10. Yeah, it turns out that there's a lot of tricks that people do to convert hard problems to linear programming ones. And that's why it's so famous. And last but not least, let's talk about convex optimization problems. So convex optimization problems are problems of the form, let's write again, the form of any type of mathematical optimization problem. By the way, writing min of f0 of x is not the correct way. I remember my professor <laughs> when I was studying in Paris, um, he used to tell us never ever write min down. You should always write minimize. Always do that. Min is not the correct way even though I use it a lot for shorthand because I'm lazy, but it's not the correct way to write minimize. Now in convex optimization, you have, of course, an objective function and constraints, but what's, why is it called convex? It's because the objective function f0 and the constraints fi are convex functions. Now, what is a convex function? If you'd look at it in 1D, in one dimensions, it looks something like, say, this it's bending downwards so if you join let's say a chord it's called a chord if you connect two points with a straight line not only that if you choose any two points at random any two points and you connect them with a straight line it turns out that the line connecting the two points is always on top of the curve that's what a convex function means so this guy right here is said to be convex and what it mathematically means is that for any two values, x, y, and any two non-zero scalars, not necessarily zero scalars, alpha and beta, f of alpha x plus beta y, which is the black portion, is always less than or equal to the linear combination of those two points, which is the red line. And it's written mathematically as follows. Alpha f of x plus beta f of y. So the black curve, the, the function, is always less than the red line, which is a linear combination of f of x and f of y, the two points right here. So this point right here is x, and this point right here is y, and their corresponding values is f of x and f of y on the y-axis. So a linear combination is, you know, alpha f of x plus beta f of y. So alpha and beta should also add up to 1, where alpha plus beta is 1, and they're also positive. So alpha is positive and beta is positive. 
so you could see alpha and beta as some sort of probabilities or weight. So when alpha is zero and beta is one, you are on X. And the opposite, when alpha is zero and beta is one, you are on Y. And anywhere in between, you're just wandering, you're just spanning the red line. When alpha is half, beta is half, you're at the midpoint. So yeah, that's what convex function not convex optimization. A convex function means convex optimization means all your functions, your objective function, and your constraints are convex. If only one is not convex, then the problem is no longer convex. Now, if we go back to least squares and to linear programming, what can we say about them? <laughs> Well, for least squares, we didn't say that while talking about convex optimization, but um, convex optimization is not necessarily only for 1D, it's for n dimensions as well. This definition that we wrote right here also applies for n dimensions when x and y are vectors. And least squares, you could easily prove that the objective function is convex. Least squares has no constraints, so we're only concerned about the objective function. Therefore, this means that the least squares problem is also a convex optimization problem. Linear programming also, which has its objective function and constraints being linear and x, Therefore, it is convex. Why? Because a linear function is also a convex function. Why is it? Why is it so? Well, simply just look at this black curve right here as a linear function. It will coincide with the red line right here. And this right here is with equality. So, so the guy right here would be satisfied with equality. What does that mean? It means that you have satisfied your convex function property, which means that any linear function is also convex. And therefore, linear programming is within the class of convex optimization. Okay? Now, it turns out that solving convex optimization problems has also, like linear programming, no closed form solution. But again, there's a lot of reliable and efficient algorithms to solve convex optimization problems. They work with second order quantities such as the Hessians and evaluating them is not computationally friendly. Okay, it, it, it requires something like of order n square or n cube, something proportional to that. You're dealing with matrices, don't forget that, so you have another dimension. But roughly speaking, their computational time is proportional to n cube or n square m, right? So as we saw right here, it's n square m. I did a mistake right here, it should be. So over here, you find also methods that solve problem with o n cube or o n square m. Also, it depends on the uh, method itself. You have also other methods that, as we mentioned, compute gradients, and therefore you have to add to that their time of computation. And also, it turns out that many problems that are not easily seen as convex, they could be transformed to convex optimization problems. Now, why would you want to take a convex optimization course? It's simply because a lot of problems nowadays boil down to convex optimization, either by using some formal tricks or you need some mathematical, you know, step or two to transform a known problem to a convex optimization one. And therefore, you can use convex optimization tools to solve your problem in hand. So the first motivation of you taking such a course is recognizing problems as convex ones. And two is so that we could, you know, always propose the best solution that is there, right? The optimal solution to a convex optimization problem is what we always want to propose. So later on, you're not going to compute it by hand, right? So you would want to propose a method or sometimes an algorithm if a closed form does not exist on how to reach your optimal solution. Therefore, we will also see some programming and the language really is not important right here. We're not going to write a, a software to solve your solution, no. We're going to write some simple code either on MATLAB or Python. If you want me to use a certain language, you can just hit me an email. My email is in the description below and I'll choose the programming language you guys vote for the most. I might also write the same code in multiple languages. I'll leave that later on once I reach this phase, okay? And uh, last but not least, you would want to also, you know, give some quantitative description or a certain characterization of your optimal solution. So how close, maybe it's not the best solution, so how close is it 
to the best solution. So in this case, we talk about some performance bounds, right? So really, those are the goals and topics of the Convex optimization course that I'll be presenting to you guys. So before wrapping up this course, let me just give a brief history of Convex optimization. So the theory all started in the 1900s. And one of the main contributors that I would like to cite is Taro Rockefeller. So, you know, with the theory comes the applications and the algorithms and the methods, you know. So the methods started with the so-called simplex method, which was founded by a famous mathematician called Danzig. It was founded somewhere in the 47, 1947. And by the way, um, Professor Rockefeller was awarded the Danzig Prize, named after the mathematician Danzig, in 1982. So another method that is worth mentioning is the interior point methods. And there is a lot of mathematicians that we could mention here, like Fiaccio, McCormick. We've also got Dickin and many others. And that was in the year 1960, something like that. Other methods that are worth mentioning are subgradient methods or ellipsoid methods. Also, we have the polynomial time interior point method for linear programming by Karl Markar in 1984. And from the 80s till now, people are spending a lot of time on stuff like interior point methods for nonlinear convex optimization. So polynomial time, IPM, but for nonlinear, because Karl Markar was for linear programming. So right now, people have decided to step out of their comfort zones and tackle nonlinear convex optimization problems. So people worth mentioning are Nesterov and Nemirovsky. Now there's a lot on the list, and I'm really sorry if I didn't mention any other notable work. People from the 80s till now are spending a bunch of time on topics and people nowadays are proposing interior point methods for nonlinear convex optimization. You've also got the work by Boyd himself, so Stefan Boyd. Stefan Boyd is one of the major contributors to convex optimization. You've got his work on proximal methods, so this is a recent one. You've got his work on non-smooth convex programs. So I'm referring here to the graph implementations of his work. That was in 2008. So his PhD thesis was on Volterra series. And so we know in electrical engineering, there's a lot of passive or active devices. They're modeled as nonlinear. They also have this characteristic of having memory. And Volterra series are known to model memory. So the major contribution of his PhD thesis was to give a better explanation of the Volterra series. He provided much better intuitive ways of really understanding the Volterra kernels. What a kernel is, is simply one term of the Volterra series. So if you know about Taylor series, you know, the sum of terms of power k, each term could be referred to as a Taylor kernel. Likewise, a Volterra kernel was not well understood by the community. Thanks to Boyd, he gave us a better explanation of what it really means. Not just that, he also proposed efficient and fast ways of actually measuring those Volterra kernels for nonlinear devices that we previously mentioned. So just measure some inputs and outputs, you collect those data, you apply what Boyd proposed, and voila, you can estimate the Volterra kernels, which means that you can model the nonlinear device. He's also known for applying convex optimization for linear matrix inequalities and many more. He was also one of the co-authors along with Michael Grant with a software called CVX, which is open source, available for anyone to use. And he is also the co-author of the first reference of this course, which is a book called Convex Optimization, which is co-authored by Leiven van den Berg. And with the history comes applications, right? So, so we've got a bunch of, you know, applications on convex optimization. So, so first, uh, first it was developed with the intent to work with operational research, right? So stuff like you're solving, I don't know, a transportation problem or you want to, 
you know you have some some operations going on and you would want to find the best solution for it, right then after the 1990s we started seeing many applications in engineering going from signal processing we've also seen applications in communications finance circuit design electrical engineering and many others and you know with history comes new problems so we've got also new classes of problems showing up such as semi-definite and second order on programming robust optimization and many others right so finally i'm going to give you the references that contributed in those videos so i'd like to first start with the book by stefan boyd and vandenberg it's this book right here so i would highly recommend this book if you really want to go deep into the proofs you want to take a broader vision of what convex optimization is really is you know, it's a really nice book to keep aside when you're doing your research you want to come back and you know you have a certain optimization problem and you would like to find which one is the closest to it this book is really really it comes in hand and there's a lot of you know if you're doing your masters or you're in engineering you're in mathematics and you want to solve some problems well this is the book for you it has super useful problems they helped me a lot when i was doing my masters it gives you really a big different vision of what optimization is about Next, we have this book by Nesterov. Of course, he's a Russian. So he contributed in polynomial time, interior point methods for nonlinear but convex optimization. So this is a book by Nesterov himself. This book is super useful if you want to come into the optimization world and you have no background whatsoever, right? So this is another point of view given by Professor Nesterov on what convex optimization really is and gives you a lot of you know applications to it and last but not least you have this wonderful book by bental and nemirovsky so nemirovsky is nesterov's friend <laughs> so if we go back here he, he was the second person we mentioned here on interior point methods right those are not the only you know authors that are in optimization but those are the ones that have benefited me the most those are the ones that inspired me to really you know dig deeper into what convex optimization is so yeah those are the three references i highly recommend you to take a look at at least one of them yeah this is basically it so that's it for lecture one where we talked about what optimization really is we gave a few examples and factors that come into play we also showed you some efficient and reliable problems that could be solved and others that could not. We also talked about what the goal of this course really is, to which audience this course is targeted. And finally, we gave some history and the references for this course. In the next lecture, we're going to be talking about convex sets. So what is a convex set? We're going to give some examples on that going to go deeper into the math, you know, we're going to talk about convex combinations, affine combinations, and much, much more. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and like this video. You can also share it on social media. I would be very grateful for that. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much.